Good afternoon. Welcome to Douglas County on Power Lunch, and I am Randy Whitaker with Bank of the Ozarks and your 2017 Chairman of the Board. I would like to invite Reverend Dr. Edwin Jones, pastor of Bright Star United Methodist Church, to come forward and lead us in our pledge and invocation. Let us pray. <clears throat> o God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, we come together again to give thanks to you for this brand new day, for this great place, and for this place we call Douglasville, for all of these incredible men and women who make up this town and this county and this Chamber of Commerce. We give you thanks for each and every one of them, for what they do to make this town what it is. We are also most grateful for being together today to bless all those brave men and women we want to honor and celebrate today. We are so grateful for their incredible courage and bravery and for their unflinching willingness to walk into harm's way, regardless of the cost. Whether it is here in Douglasville, in California, in Texas, in Puerto Rico, or around the world. <clears throat> Be with them and bless them and bless their families. And grant that we may never take any of them for granted. Give unto them the wisdom and the guidance that they need to do what they must do every single day to make this world a bigger and better and safer and more secure world for all of us to enjoy. Bless us also as we gather to feed and to feast in fellowship around these tables, always keeping us mindful of those who have nothing to eat and to do whatever we can to eliminate that need. Be with our speaker and grant that what she has to say to us today may inspire us to do something to help and to heal a hurting world. We ask all these things in the name of him who said that I have come that you might have life and have it in all of its fullness. And all of us who gathered here today said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> We pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. May I ask our elected officials to stand and be recognized. Chamber board members, please stand and introduce yourselves. Roscoe, we are so glad to have you back with us and, and um, pray for your recovery. We're also very proud of our 2017 Chairman's Club members that joined us today. I am sure many of you noted them on the slides prior to the luncheon. 
But I want to say thank you and recognize the group sitting here up front. <clears throat> Finally, our Chamber Diplomats, please stand and be recognized as a group. As many of you know, the Chamber Diplomats are a group of 30 individuals who collectively represent the Chamber in the community at ribbon cuttings and events and in many other ways behind the scenes. If you will Thank you. Now I would like to invite Odette Simmons, District Manager for Atlanta Metro West of the American Red Cross, to come forward to say a few words about what is going on with Red Cross in Douglas County. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Odette Simmons and I'm the District Manager with the American Red Cross. I've been with the Red Cross for about four and a half years a proud resident of this great county in which I live, work, and play. I'm also a graduate of the Leadership, Leadership Douglas class of 2015, the bravest class ever. Uh, thanks to the Douglas County Chamber for this opportunity today to share some information with you about the American Red Cross Blood Services and Humanitarian Services. The American Red Cross is located on Riverside Parkway where our blood processing center is housed. The 182,500 square foot facility became fully operational in May of 2007 and is headquarters to the Southern Blood Services region. The Southern region includes most of the state of Georgia, as well as the Hilton Head area of South Carolina and Northeast Florida. Our center processes more than 340,000 units of blood and blood products from the Southern region Alabama Gulf Coast and parts of the Carolina regions each year. Our blood management team operates in this facility and registers approximately 700,000 blood donor records annually, which is the largest in the nation. The Southern Regions Partners for Life blood program matches donors who have rare or special blood types with children in need of life-sustaining blood transfusions due to sickle cell disease. Approximately every two seconds, someone in the U.S. needs blood. Just 38% of, of the population is eligible to give blood, and only a fraction of those people do actually do. The Southern Blood Services region needs 1,200 donations each weekday to serve patients in need. The average adult has 10 to 12 units, pints of blood in their body. One donation could help to save up to three lives. The Southern Region is the supplier for about 100 local hospitals. Every day, the Red Cross must, co must collect about 14,000 blood donations for patients at approximately 2,600 hospitals and transfusion centers across the country. The American Red Cross is the single largest supplier in the United States, providing 40% of the nation's blood. On your table, you'll see a list of upcoming blood drives in and around the Douglas County area. Please feel free to make an appointment and donate blood. The need is constant. The gratification is instant. 80% of the blood donations made through Red Cross are at set, blood, set up blood drives in community organizations, businesses, schools, and churches. The remaining 20% are at blood donation centers. New blood drive sponsors are always needed. If you're interested in hosting a blood drive, please don't hesitate to contact the American Red Cross or see one of us afterwards. Um, there's no substitute for blood. Healthy, generous donors are the only source of blood for patients in need. Please make a date to donate blood. Uh, also want to talk a little bit about our humanitarian services. Um, in the past seven weeks, the American Red Cross has launched wide-ranging relief efforts to help people devastated by three historic back-to-back -back hurricanes. Harvey, Irma, and Maria. And now the Red Cross is helping thousands of families affected by the deadliest week of wildfires in California's history. The Red Cross is on the ground, part of a large team of agencies and organizations responding to provide help to communities turned upside down. With regards to the California wildfire, uh, overnight, the Red, almost 5,000 people sought refuge from wildfires in 57 American Red Cross, um, in 57 Red Cross and community shelters across the state. With the help of partners, the Red Cross has served more than 20,000 meals and snacks and provided more than 1,100 mental health 
services to support and care for those affected. More than 430 Red Cross disaster workers are on the ground in California now, with an additional 190 on the way. With response to hurricane, the hurricanes, in the past seven weeks, the Red Cross, along with community and government partners, have provided 1.2 million overnight stays in emergency shelters. That's more overnight stays than the past five years combined. Shelters were open in eight states, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. For Hurricane Harvey, 431,000 overnight stays um, in Texas and Louisiana. For Irma, more than 648,000 overnight stays in across, in across six states, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, with regards to the Las Vegas shootings, the thoughts and deepest sympathies of the entire American Red Cross family are with those affected by the tragic shooting in Las Vegas. The Red Cross is working in close coordination with emergency officials to provide comfort and support to those affected. Following the shooting, the Red Cross has provided more than 450 additional blood products to hosp local hospitals to help those injured. We stand ready to provide more blood and blood products as needed in response to this tragedy. We understand that people around the country want to help and we appreciate that support. Thanks to the Douglas County Chambers, the heroes among us, each and every individual represented here today, and to blood donors everywhere for saving lives each and every day. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Odette. We appreciate the American Red Cross support in uh, making today's lunch impossible. We are extremely happy to have the opportunity to honor our local public safety officials today for the great job they do each and every day throughout the year. Please stand as we call your department so we may recognize you. Douglasville Police Department. Douglas County Sheriff's Department. <laughs> Douglas County Fire Department and EMS. <laughs> Emergency 911 Center. <laughs> Emergency Management Services. We have included some interesting facts and statistics from each of, you, each of your department in your luncheon program. Please take a few minutes to read over the program so you can understand and appreciate all these first responders do for our community. On behalf of Douglas County Chamber and our business community, we would like to express our gratitude for your dedication and compassion. We are honored to have each of you serve in our community. You work tirelessly each and every day to make your community safe, and you are all heroes to us. Thank you, and I think you deserve a stand. At this time, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Ms. Donna Rowe, and I, I promise you uh, we got a brief synopsis uh, in the, with the chamber chair, uh, chairman's club, excuse me, and uh, if it's anything like that, you're going to be uh, wild, I promise you. It's been 48 years since Donna returned from a 369-day tour of duty in Vietnam, where she served as a head nurse in the triage unit at the Third Field Hospital. Since then, she has raised two sons with her late husband, Colonel Al Rowe, served more than 30 years as a volunteer Red Cross nurse, and spent 28 years as a realtor and broker. We are so glad she's able to be with us today and share her stories from the Vietnam War as a triage nurse and her message for the heroes amongst us. Please join me in welcoming Miss Donna Rowe. You are great. <laughs> you are just great. You are just great. Well, I am absolutely thrilled to be with you today. And um, I want to thank my Red Cross gals that sat with me and uh, put up with me at lunchtime because I'm, I'm a full, full boat of work to be with, I'll tell you that right now. 
But I want to thank Stacy. Where's Stacy? Uh, Stacy for coordinating this. There she is. And uh, my technical support, Whitney, right? Over here for uh, helping me out when I first got here today. Um, I sincerely appreciate the chamber honoring our first responders. And it just so happens that it coincides with us getting prepared for Veterans Day. And I know in the midst of these <clears throat> men and women out here that are our first responders, there are also veterans among them. And how lucky we are that they served their country and then came back and decided to serve their community one more time, again in a dangerous way. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you do not only for the people of Douglasville, but for the people of Georgia and the people of our nation, because you are our first line of defense. And I respect that and I honor that in you. First, I want to um, tell you a little bit about what happened to me this week. And I'm going to, I wander around a lot, guys, so you're just going to have to put up with me. Um, I had a very good friend. His name is Bill Kalish. And I'm going to tell you his story because it leads into what I really want to talk to you about. Bill Kalish was a Marine, Navy Annapolis graduate, flew helicopter to Vietnam. And he called me the other day and he said, Donna, I just got a call from the White House. I said, oh my gosh, how exciting can that be? And he said, they want me up there because I saved a person that's going to get the Medal of Honor. Now I want to tell you a little bit about that story before I tell you my story. The story, and I wrote this down as he was talking to me, so I don't have it typed, you know, like on my Word doc or anything like that. His name is Captain Gary Mike Rose, like the flower. He was 19 years old in Vietnam. Just so you'll all get a good picture of what we looked like in Vietnam, would you believe the average age was 18? Would you believe the average age of the women was 21? Of the 58,267 names on the wall in Washington, D.C., hold that thought, 58,000. 33,301 are 18. We were young. We grew up fast. But anyways, Gary Mike Rose, captain now, was a medic for the Special Forces. And for those of you who don't know what our Special Forces did in Vietnam, unlike we were told back home by the media, we did go into Laos and Cambodia. Just thought you'd like to know that's where the supply trail was. So we did go there. So even though they said we didn't, we did. <clears throat> so he was on Operation Tailwind which was going into Laos, cut off the supply of the troops going south to take us on in Saigon, where I was stationed. He had 120 mountain yards. And for those of you that don't know who the mountain yards are, they are the indigenous people, the Navajo Indians of Vietnam. And they are fierce fighters. And he had 16 on his A team. They went into Laos and encountered a full brigade of North Vietnamese regulars. 16 of our guys, 120 mountain yards, took on a full, full fledged, not Viet Cong, I'm talking full fledged regular military communists out of North Vietnam. Fought that battle for four solid days. In the process, 47 mountain yards were wounded. All 16 special forces were wounded, including Gary himself. But he patched his foot up, he made himself crutches, 
and still took care of all those people. He was the only medic. When the first helicopter ship came in to pull him out, he got all his wounded on board first. Good combat medic. The second ship came in and took so much fire it was shot down. Here, 35 of them remained on the ground, under fire by the North Vietnamese. The third ship came in and they scrambled to the ship, wounded and all, and got on the tail of that ship. They pulled out and again, that ship was shot down with them on board. Gary was on the tail of that aircraft and him and the guy on the tail were thrown clear of the crash. He got up, went over to the crash and continued to take care of the men in the shot down helicopter. And then over the ridge came Bill Kalish, Marine, flying, looking for where these people were. Two crashed helicopters on the site, 30 of our people on the ground, including Gary Michael Rose, to be Medal of Honor recipient next Monday. Those are the heroes you need to hear about. Not the documentaries that they tend to run on public television. I'm here to tell you the true story of the veterans of the Vietnam War. But before I tell you that, I want to tell you where we came from, who we were, what we represented when we went off to war. We were the sons and daughters of the greatest generation. And they raised us love of God, love of country, love of family, and loyalty to our friends. We didn't all come from Georgia. We came from the mountains of Utah. We came from the native lands of New Mexico. We came from the banks of the Mississippi River, where my husband came from, Dubuque, Iowa. We came from the big cities of Chicago, New York, Detroit. We came from the mountains and the plains of Georgia. And we came even from the little New England town where I was raised with 750 people, of which 12 of us served in Vietnam. We were raised with loyalty to our country. That's who we were. The men and women of today that are serving our country, they are our sons and daughters. So when you're dealing with our sons and daughters, us Vietnam vets can get very testy about making sure they get the proper homecoming that their mummies and daddies never got. But then I want you all to think about the people that have made you free. The reason we can sit here today, the reason we can walk outside this building, get in those cars, see the little school buses coming home not being blown up, the reason for that is generation after generation after generation that served this country in uniform. All the way back to Bunker Hill. In our blood runs the blood of patriots. In our blood is that honesty about defending our country. So you think of World War II, my mother's and father's war. 400,000 gave their lives on the frozen earth of Normandy in the Battle of the Bulge where General George Patton took on the Panzer Division of the Germans. And then you had MacArthur in the Philippines in the Bataan Death March. And then you had people like General Raymond Davis, Georgian, Medal of Honor recipient, Marine, who fought through the frozen tundra of the Chosan Reservoir in Korea to save a platoon of Marines that was caught behind the lines. That kind of person 
how lucky we are to call them a Georgian. Then my war, the war of the young, the war of the youth. As I said, the average age of the men was 18. Average age of the women, 21. I was an old woman in Vietnam because I was 24. And they called me the old lady. <laughs> My men did. Old lady. Cute little thing, five foot four, blue eyes, 122 pounds, not bad, you know, but the old lady. Now, my combat medics, I want to tell you about them. Every single one of my medics, 39 of them, worked with me in the triage area. I want you to visualize my triage area. Take this room, multiply it times two, take out the walls, add 100% humidity, 115 degree weather, monsoon rain every afternoon around three, and a helicopter pad on the other side of that parking lot because they couldn't land around me because I had too many wires. 39 corpsmen. We could take 150 down and 60 up at one time. You want to talk about mass casualty? It was every day a mass casualty. Average day in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive, 700 casualties. Not at all at my hospital. But my men, Perez from New Mexico, a little short, uh, Native American, Spanish, little guy, but best damn medic I ever had. Sergeant Grant, my first sergeant, tall, skinny, black, shaved his head from Detroit, Michigan. He was my first sergeant and he didn't mess around. But also in that triage area with me were 42 doctors, four wonderful chaplains, and three great Red Cross gals. Now I'm going to tell you right now, in World War II they called the Red Cross the Donut Dollies. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, we didn't serve no donuts in that triage area. But those gals were there. I was the only RN. My job was to make sure they were stopped the bleeding, breathing, and I need your name. Because you see, guys, not everyone wore their dog tags around their neck. Gee, why didn't they do that? They clinkled. And if they didn't have tape, they put them in their boots. Guess what we lost a lot of? Boots. They didn't all come in with boots. So my job was to get the name. But the Red Cross gals, the screaming for their mothers, the screaming, am I going to die? The screaming for their wives. The screaming, I need to write my mother. Guess who stood by the side of those litters and did exactly that? It was the Red Cross. It wasn't Donna Rowe. Donna Rowe was worrying about getting an IV started on him. I wasn't worried about writing a letter to his mother. And people ask me if I remember the names of my casualties. No, I don't. I'm going to tell you right now, I've psychoanalyzed myself. I decided somewhere in my time in Vietnam that if I remembered the names, it made it too personal. But I remember every in injury, every single one of them. But now that you've got the vision of the triage area and the total bedlam that goes on in there, we had eight full helicopters on the way one day, and this is what the movie's about. And who would have known that on May 16, 1969, that Donna Rowe, her 39 corpsmen, the four chaplains, the three Red Cross gals, and would all be involved in an incident that turned back everything that Jane Fonda and John Kerry said about us because this is what came across the radio. Tail number 191, need immediate permission to land, has severely injured baby on board, need to land immediately. Sergeant Grant, my big tall first sergeant from Detroit, Michigan, he turned to me and he said, Captain, what am I gonna tell him? 
The reason he was asking that is because we were in the middle of the May offensive. And we were put on what's called offensive mode, which meant U.S. military first, U.S. civilian second, third, allied forces, Thailand, Korea, Australia, all great warriors. Host country military and last was civilian. Reason? Think of Atlanta. They had their own hospitals. We were the only military hospital in Saigon. But my mother, all four foot 11 of her, had said to me before I went to Vietnam, whatever you do, Donna, do the right thing and come home safe. I turned to Sergeant Grant and I said, Sergeant Grant, tell him Third Field Hospital will receive. And Sergeant Grant picked up that microphone to give that, relay that back, and he turned to me before he did, and he said, Captain, you're going to take hell for this. And I looked at him and I said, I am already in hell, so what else can they do to me? <laughs> that ambulance, back door man, the back door was Specialist Greer, Minnesota. When the back of that ambulance opened, it flew open. And he said, oh my God, Captain. He said, we had to break the arms of the dead mother. Her whole village is gone. She's the only survivor. And the medic on board, the chopper, had told my medic the story, and this is the story. We think it was the 1st Infantry Division. They were on a sweep. They were following the North Vietnamese, and they were decimating villages in their path. The North Vietnamese were not Americans. We went into this village. Everyone in the village was killed, except they heard the whimpering of a small child. Now, I want you to visualize this child fit from my palm to my elbow. They went and picked her up and called in a dust off. In the process, they got in a firefight. That dust off came in anyways. That dust off was piloted by uh, Alderman, David Alderman. Three tours Vietnam, 25,000 casualties pulled out of war, 7,000 flights. This guy is a hero, the same as Bill Kalish. These are the heroes of the Vietnam War. This is why I come out and talk to you. David Alderman and his crew picked up that baby and kept her alive long enough to get her to us. Now, when she arrived, she had a frag in her chest, a frag in her abdomen. She was blowing up with blood and couldn't breathe. We intubated her, we started an IV, and I am breathing on Ambu bag for her, rushing down the hallway, and I grabbed the Catholic chaplain, sorry, <laughs> even though I'm a Methodist, because we supported a Catholic orphanage, and I knew they'd take her if she lived. But with my faith that my parents and my hometown had taught me, if she didn't live, if she was baptized, I knew she was going to heaven. Because you know, Reverend, there is no denomination in war. There's just faith. Father Sullivan came running alongside that gurney. We came around the corner to go away from the triage and into the surgical suite. He says, I have no holy water, Donna. I said, Father, when it, water hits your hand, it's holy as far as I'm concerned. Baptize this baby. And he put his head on her hand, her head, and he said, I baptize thee. And I said, name her Kathleen. For the Irish song, I'll take you home again, Kathleen. Because that's what Al and I were going to name our first daughter. Well, as he just told you, I ended up with John, Peter, and Richard, so <laughs> kind of glad I gave it away. <laughs> Baby Kathleen survived that surgery. But Father Sullivan had made Don Brittenham, the surgeon, black, Buddhist, from Detroit, Daryl Warren, Mormon, Salt Lake City, Utah, 
Richard Hawk, Kennesaw, Georgia, who was an EMT in Atlanta after the war, and Donna Rowe, the godparents. And he had to write a letter to the Monsignor explaining how a Mormon, a Buddhist, a <laughs> Methodist, and a Catholic got on a baptismal certificate being sent back to the San Francisco diocese. He wrote a letter that went with that, and it's in my scrapbook. I had three weeks left to go in Vietnam. When I left Vietnam, baby Kathleen was in the orphanage. Then I got a letter from Father Sullivan saying, baby Kathleen had been adopted by a, Marine, by a Navy nurse that took care of the Marines at the embassy because he heard the story and didn't want to leave her in that killing field of Vietnam. So he brings her back to this country. And that's all I knew. 34 years later, I told the exact same story to the documentary filmmaker uh, Arrowhead Films at Austin, Texas. They called me three months later and said, are you sitting down? And I said, no, I can be. And uh, they said, you won't believe this. Someone wants your personal information. I said, well, that's fine. And she said, no, we just don't give away that. I said, well, who wants it? She said, you're not going to believe this. It's the baby. She'd been looking and Googling for us since she was 13. She's now 35 years old. She's now 40. She was looking for the names on that baptismal certificate that the priest had given her because she wanted to know where her people were. I'm the one that had to tell her she has no people. They were all killed by the North Vietnamese. But she has her own family. And I want to tell you this. You know, I'm Irish. You could never tell that, I'm sure. But um, I'm Irish, and she's married to an Irishman. She lives in Donnyville, California. And these are her four children. And so when someone tells you that we killed children in Vietnam, I want you to hold this picture in your mind. Because the good men and women I served with didn't kill anyone. We saved the children in Vietnam. The women of Vietnam, the women that I'm very proud to have served with, there were 11,000 of us that served in Vietnam. Of the 11,000, eight of our names are on the wall. All Army nurses. So I want to show you just a small clip of this film that Whitney's going to be kind enough to run for us. And this is the trailer to the movie In the Shadow of the Blade. And you can Google it. And I have a slick if you want it afterwards. But go ahead, Whitney, run it. The Army honored the Native Americans by naming their helicopters after the brave warriors who were fearless in battle. They named it the UH-1 Iroquois. In Vietnam, we called it the Huey. When I play and I look at the, at the Huey, it's empty to me. And what happens is, is that it gets filled with all the spirits that have ridden that, that helicopter, whether they be pilots or that young man sitting there staring with scared to death holding his M16. It is time to awaken the screen angel. We rode the war in the Huey, and that whoop, 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 it burned into our brains. As this thing goes around the country, it'll bring back a lot of memories, both good and bad. But to see that bird come in flaring land, I think will bring a lot of good 
to a lot of people. It's not a, a machine, it's a living thing. These guys came home to no welcome. We did something because we were patriotic and we thought we were doing the right thing. But flying in that aircraft today really reminded me of who I am. I'll never look at myself the same way again. This is the closest touch we've had for my brother since he left. I just felt that he was with me up there. It's a welcome home that we never had. Absolutely fantastic. I loved it. I loved it. I'm going to start crying. It was absolutely great. Felt good not to see any green tracers coming our way. Yep. Clear. 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 All clear. In the shadow of the blade. In the shadow of the blade. For those guys, we able to come back to this aircraft and say hello, thank you, and goodbye. One coming in, one of us going home, yet another young heart turning cold as a stone. Feeling on your skin, Lord, that smell, somebody hollered out, y'all, well, come to hell. Where there is no light, living in the shadow. That's the film, that's baby Kathleen, and that's my story. But the story didn't end with us in Vietnam. It's still going on today in the cities and mountains of Afghanistan, Syria, Iran. And it's still going on today in our streets. They've come to our shores and standing between us and them are these first responders. Backing up these first responders are our wonderful National Guards men and women. And backing them up is the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard. So I think my pay for coming here today, I don't charge, just want you to know this is free, all right? But my payment, I do have a payment. The next time you see a man or woman in uniform, whether they be a first responder or whether they're wearing the uniform of one of our services, I want you to do one thing and think of Donna Rowe and baby Kathleen when you do it. Number one, I want you to thank them for your freedom and I want you to buy them that cup of coffee or pick up their tab at Waffle House or whatever it is. That's my payment. You can pay me back and baby Kathleen back by doing that one thing. Now, I never leave without giving something. I like a little, I leave breadcrumbs as I go along in my speaking. But I do like to give um, on behalf of all the Vietnam vets. I like to give our host the Vietnam, Georgia Vietnam Veterans coin. And it says on it, freedom is not free. The price of freedom sometimes is war. And the price of war is the sacrifice not only of the men and women that go, but their families that stay home. And I thank you very much for having me. But come up here, I want to give this to you. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Well, did I underpromise? <laughs> thank you, Donna, for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. As a thank you for speaking, a contribution will be made in your name to the Chamber Board Scholarship Fund, which funds a scholarship for graduating high school seniors. Thank you. All right, and now for a few announcements. Chamber announcements are during the month of October, we will be celebrating our members all month long. Each October, Chamber member businesses receive a big thank you. Chamber board members, diplomats, and staff go to door, door to door, visiting member businesses to learn how to better serve you. Be on the lookout for your visit in this month. Our chamber membership uh, appreciation cookout will be held on October the 31st at the chamber office. The chamber board of directors will be cooking lunch for our members from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. 
It's free, so bring your whole office. Douglas County's fifth annual Festival of Trees will begin the first week in November. The items will be on display on the third floor of the Douglas County Courthouse. For additional information on sponsoring a wreath or a tree, contact Jennifer Moore. And I think, is Jennifer here? Yes, and I said you, you would take uh, money as well, right? Absolutely. All right. The American Red Cross has provided our door prizes, so I'm going to ask Odette if she would to please come back forward, and uh, we're going to draw a few door prizes. All right, our first door prize is a $25 American Express gift card. 197388. 197388. Make sure it's not in my pocket. <laughs> All, right. All right, the next one is American Cross uh, goodie bag. One nine seven three six five. Is this the movie night? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then our final prize is a movie night on the American Red Cross. One nine seven three two nine. Three two nine. Billy Mayhew. <laughs> Thanks again to the American Red Cross for sponsoring today's luncheon and the Grace Zone Power for their name and sponsorship. I hope you have a great day.